Biden visits Ukraine and pledges the country 500 million more dollars in military support, even as his own constituents in Ohio are reeling from disaster. And a new survey about dating preferences tells us a lot about the younger generations and the future of our country. The future of our country is the theme of today's episode, which is brought to you by our friends at Good Ranchers. Go to GoodRanchers.com. Use promo code Allie at checkout. That's GoodRanchers.com. Code Allie. Hey guys, welcome to Relatable. Happy Tuesday. Hope everyone is having a great week. If you haven't listened to yesterday's episode with Jennifer Say, former executive at Levi's, reacting to the recent meta analysis and the recent study proving that many of us have been right about COVID and masks and natural immunity for a very long time, then you need to go listen to it. It's a really encouraging episode. And when there's so much bad news today, there's so much to just be discouraged about. And quite frankly, we're going to talk about some of that stuff today when we get to Ohio and Ukraine and the threat of nuclear war. Um, It's really good to be reminded that sometimes, sometimes, uh, Pushing for that which is good and right and true does have pretty quick and tangible results. People still lost their jobs over those lies, over that propaganda, over the bullying that we saw, not just from individuals, but I mean, social media giants, bosses, CEOs, all kinds of employers firing people, taking away their livelihoods because of the vaccine and all of that. So I'm not saying all of the consequences have just gone away because science is finally caught up to common sense, but it is nice and sometimes reassuring to see the truth actually come to light in a relatively quick manner. Again, I don't want it to sound like I'm diminishing the consequences that people have had to deal with because of the COVID restrictions, but the truth is coming to light. It will continue to come to light and there will be a day when people will be embarrassed to have defended all of the things that they defended during this so-called um, pandemic. All right. A couple of you, before we get into our first segment, a couple of you, few of you, Several of you messaged me, commented on YouTube about my poor, poor sunburn that you saw yesterday. If you go back and you listen to yesterday or you watch yesterday's episode on YouTube, rather, um, you will see what looked like a pink a pink shirt that I was wearing under my sweatshirt. And then when I finally said during one of the ads, no, this is a sunburn, a lot of you guys were aghast. You were taken aback by how bad of a sunburn I got. And I meant to talk about this at the start of yesterday's show. And I just forgot. And the reason I wanted to mention it is because I actually kind of look different. And you guys might not notice because I've got the lights, I've got makeup on, but underneath this miraculous magical makeup that I am wearing is my worst sunburn that I have ever gotten in my life. As I said on Instagram, as I think I mentioned yesterday, my husband and I, we went to uh, South Florida for my birthday. We stayed at a really nice hotel and it was really fun. But on Saturday, that was our only full day there. It it was mostly cloudy and windy. And so it was kind of cold. And so we kind of felt like we weren't really getting sun a lot of the day or a lot of the many of the hours of the day. We didn't actually see the sun. So we did put sunscreen on, but we just didn't put enough sunscreen on. We didn't think that the UV rays are as strong behind the clouds and all of that. We made a huge mistake. All right. Mistakes were made when we were in Miami. And the mistake was not to put on SPF 70 while we were in the sun for like six hours. And so both my husband and I are suffering from the worst sunburns that we've ever gotten. And let me tell you how bad the sunburn is for me. I think it's worse for me than it is for him because on my face, it's so bad. Um, underneath this, you would be able to see how red it is. It's kind of blistering. Don't worry, I'm taking care of it. I've got all the remedies and everything like that. It is healing, thank the Lord. But it's not only that, it has also caused my face to swell. 
And it's actually a miracle. I'm looking at myself right now on a monitor, how different I look than when I walked into this studio. I told the makeup artist, I said, I need you to work a miracle today because it is causing, because the sunburn is so bad. And I guess like, you know, your, your blood fluids rush to the place where the bad sunburn is to try to, um, you know, heal it, help it, whatever it is, just like any other injury. It is causing like the bridge of my nose and even my eyelids to swell. So it makes my eyes look farther apart than they actually are. And it makes them look smaller than they actually are. And that is not a good thing when you have a job that requires you to be in front of a camera. I texted my producer this morning. I was like, I can't do it. I'm not able to come in because I look like a beady-eyed monster. I look like some kind of creature from Narnia. But I did the ice roller, I did the ice pack and all of that, and it did help a little bit. But if I were to take my makeup off, you would be like, oh yes, what is wrong with your eyes? But it's the power of contouring, baby. It's the power of makeup. And so then I'll have to take it off and put my aloe vera on and all that kind of stuff. But for you guys in service to the relatable audience that is watching this on YouTube, I did fix it up a little bit, but pray for my pray for my sunburn. And let me just tell you, let me give you some advice, people out there, especially those of you who like me, you can get arrogant. You can get arrogant because you get tan. You kind of have an olive skin tone. And so in the summer, you can get really tan. Maybe it's even difficult for you to get burned. Yeah, that's like me. My husband, he is more fair skinned. And so I was like, you need to wear a sunscreen, not thinking about myself. I was like, oh no, I can just soak up the sun. I'll be fine. I wasn't fine. My skin hasn't really seen the hot sun in like five months. It wasn't prepared for it. So for those of you, you're going on spring break, you're going on some kind of snowbird vacation in the next few weeks, wear your sunscreen wear like SPF 50. I know, I know. And you know, I'm a part of sometimes I follow the crunchy world on Instagram and they can be anti sunscreen. I do think it's important to get unmitigated vitamin D for a certain period of time every day. But I'm telling you it is not good to get like second degree burns on your skin. It's not worth it. Just wear the sunscreen. If you're going to Mexico, you're going to California, you're going to Florida, you're going to wherever put on your sunscreen. I really wish that I had. That's my PSA to you today. Wear your sunscreen when you go on your vacations. All right. That was really, that wasn't a very important way to start the show, but it was how I wanted to start the show. So I hope it's helpful. If I save one person from getting like second degree sunburn on their nose and forehead, the way that I did, it will have been, my PSA will have been worth it. All right. I first want to talk before we get into like the most serious stuff, um, we're going to get into Ohio and Ukraine, um, but we're going to wait on that a little bit because Biden President Biden actually right now, as I'm recording this, is giving some kind of speech about where we are with our support of Ukraine. And I want to make sure to get that. I want to make sure to get some of his words and to be able to put it into this episode. So I'm going to let him talk as I am talking, as I'm recording the first couple parts of this episode. And then we'll get into that and we'll be able to have some more context with what President Biden told us. Um, so first, we're going to talk about this really fascinating dating study that I saw and what I think it means and some things to consider because I know there are a lot of moms, I would say probably mostly married women who listen to this podcast, but there are a lot of single ladies out there too. And I think that this is probably like a very unique, a, a unique female podcast because most female podcasts are about marriage and kids or they're like from a totally secular perspective and they're from like they're about like secular forms of dating and sex and things like that whereas this is a female podcast we do talk a lot about motherhood and the importance of marriage and all of that but it is also a place where single women I know and single people are they feel welcome because we're talking about the issues that affect all of us. We're talking about how any kind of person, any kind of Christian is wading through the chaos of our culture wars in a way that is hopefully and humbly biblical and 
uh, Christ centered. And so I, I wanted to look at this dating study. For those of you who are single out there, you can kind of tell me if you think that this is true, if this is true in your own life, if this is true of your feelings. And those of you who are engaged, married, whatever, I think it's important for us to know about this stuff too. Things have changed. I got married in 2015. Things have changed since then. I am not envious of those trying to navigate the dating world today because it seems ultra complicated and just a really burdensome with all of the different complexities of social media and politics and all of that. So I'm going to get into that study. I think it's important for us all to know just really fascinating findings. But first, let me stop and tell you about our first sponsor for the day before we get into that. And that is Patriot Mobile. Patriot Mobile is America's only Christian conservative wireless provider. It offers nationwide coverage on the best 4G and 5G networks. And they're fighting for the values that you and I have. So you don't have to send your money to these wireless providers that are then taking your money, giving them to organizations, politicians that are fighting against the things that you believe in. You can support a company that supports you, supports your values, supports your politics, and supports your principles. That is Patriot Mobile. They offer service with all three major networks. So if you're with one of the big three, you like their service, but you just don't like their values, you can access them with Patriot Mobile. Patriot Mobile also offers a performance guarantee. So you can switch between the three major carriers if you're not happy with your service. They've got an amazing customer service team that's all U.S. based. You can go to patriotmobile.com slash Allie or call them at 878-PATRIOT. You'll get free activation today with the offer code Allie. patriotmobile.com slash Allie or call them at 878-PATRIOT. You'll get free activation with code Allie. patriotmobile.com slash Allie. All right, this was a study conducted by the Survey Center on American Life that was published February 9th, 2023, titled From Swiping to Sexting, Ugh. The Enduring Gender Divide in American Dating and Relationships. This was a survey of more than 5,000 adults age 18 and older, including nearly 800 single adults. Okay, so they talked to... A large number of single adults, but also people who were dating, who were engaged, who were in relationships and just talked about or asked them about what are deal breakers for you? What are you looking for in a relationship? What did you look for in a relationship? And they found that people have really strong dating preferences. They have really strong opinions when it comes to the people that they want to date, especially when it comes to things like living at home, being unemployed and smoking. These are especially salient considerations this survey says for women. And now politics is another important consideration for many Americans, especially committed partisans. Most Republicans and Democrats say that they would be much less interested in dating those of the opposite political persuasion. You know, I think some people think that that's sad. Oh, we're so polarized as a country. Yeah, it is what it is. We can talk about polarization and how we got there. We've talked about that several times, actually, over the past, um, how we've gotten there over the past 10 years. But that's what it is. I mean, at this point, if you are a Republican, you are a conservative Republican, not just a moderate Republican or even maybe a liberal Republican. But if you are a conservative Republican, it is going to be hard to square your core values with a liberal Democrat, even a moderate Democrat, it's just going to be really difficult. That doesn't mean that you can't be friends. It doesn't mean that you can't be coworkers, that you can't be colleagues or peers and get along fine or that you can't respect them. But when you're talking about sharing your life with someone, when you're talking about potentially marrying someone, becoming one with someone, raising kids with someone, I would say that you really need to be on the same page when it comes to those things. I know that it's possible for Republicans and Democrats to get together and to, you know, get married and maybe have a happy life. I would say that is very rare. That's very rare, especially if both of you are very strong in your positions, because it comes down to not just policy differences, it comes down to theological differences. One of you probably believes that human beings are made in the image of God, and therefore life shouldn't be snuffed out in the womb. One of you might not believe that life really has value until the mother decides that the life has value and that they should be killed. I mean, that's a theological debate. That's a really big difference in how you view human beings and how you view morality. 
And so that chasm really only grows when you have children, unless there's some kind of about face from one of the people in the relationship. I totally understand why this is such a strong consideration among people who are trying to find a mate. Um, there is also a consideration of the potential of infidelity because the survey says is uh, infidelity is a disquietingly common experience, especially for women. So obviously that's something that women are looking out for. You know, it's also interesting. This is another just commentary that I have that I feel like for a long time, not just recently, for decades at least, there has been this push against monogamy. The monogamy isn't natural. We don't see it other places in nature. Why are we trying to put humans in a box? And then, of course, recently there's been this popularization of polyamory where you're in these uh, relationships where you have a girlfriend and a boyfriend who both have a girlfriend and a boyfriend. I mean, you're just talking about basically a constellation of chlamydia. And yet we're glorifying this as it's, you know, as if it's supposed to be something beautiful. And then these people are trying to raise children in this kind of chaotic environment. But the reality is, is that most people are actually looking for a faithful partner. Most people are looking for monogamy. You can say that it's not natural, but I think it goes back to the beginning of creation and Genesis 1, when God made them one male and one female. He set that up as the ideal and our human nature longs for it. Of course, humans try to pervert through sin all kinds of things, including relationships and marriage by trying to redefine things that really cannot be redefined because we didn't define them in the first place. We didn't create them. God did, but it just leads ultimately to misery. And that is why even non-Christian people, I think, are very often looking for that monogamous faithful relationship. Nearly half of women, the survey says, say that a partner or spouse has been unfaithful. That is just tragic, including more than six in 10 black women. Now that's interesting. So that's higher, apparently, according to the survey, than other demographics of women, white women, Hispanic women, that almost 70% of black women, wow, say that their, um, that their partner or spouse, I'm guessing mostly male partner or spouse, has been unfaithful to them. I mean, of course, you're going to be hesitant to get into another relationship. Even as online dating has made it easier than ever to become romantically involved with a complete stranger, younger Americans appear increasingly interested in dating people they already know. Isn't that an interesting development too? You know, I think that's actually why. Now, I was not on dating apps and I praise the Lord for that. I know people who have met their spouses through dating apps. And so I'm not saying that it's all bad. I, I just imagine it's very exhausting a di very difficult way uh, to meet people. So I met my husband when we were working out at a gym. So I don't really know that much about dating apps, but friends who are single or who have been single over the past 10 years, they tell me like, what's the difference in all these apps? And I know, I think Hinge is the one where you actually have to have some mutuals. So I wonder if that kind of thing is more popular or if people are just kind of abandoning dating apps in general because of what I just said. It's so tiring. It's so exhausting to just be swiping and swiping. And it is necessarily objectifying. I mean, it is. You're looking at a two-dimensional version of someone. It's not like you're hearing their laugh or you heard their personality or you interacted with them and you were kind of attracted to that three-dimensional part of them. But you were, you know, you have to just kind of look at their appearance and maybe not even their genuine appearance, but the appearance that they want you to see on the app and the qualities that they're listing on their profile and you're just kind of hoping it's sincere. I imagine that that can be a very difficult process. So I am heartened by the news that apparently, according to the survey, young people are saying, eh, I actually would like to know this person. So meeting them at church, meeting them in some kind of community event, meeting them through friends, meeting them you know, through different organizations, through work or whatever, I feel like that is probably a better and in some ways easier way to make a connection. Again, I don't want it to sound like I'm knocking on all use of dating apps because I know people who have been able to use it effectively. That doesn't invalidate your relationship at all um, that you've been able to build from that. But I can definitely see why people are graduating from that, moving on from that and saying, you know what, that was just too much. I've been doing that for the past seven years. It hasn't worked 
I'm just going to go back to the olden days when people actually met in person and had to put themselves out there and say hi to someone and possibly face in-person rejection. I understand why that's harder, but I think it's also a lot more satisfying when you really meet the person. Um, So they also analyzed marriage. And we're going to get into some of like the polls that they have that I think are really interesting. But this is just from the article itself that is explaining the explaining the survey. So about marriage, no social changes alter the fabric of American life so profoundly as the decline of marriage. That is absolutely true. It is tragically true. It is tragically true. It doesn't just go back to a Burgafell. It goes all the way back to no fault divorce. It goes all the way back to the disintegration of the institution of marriage that really has has been going on. Um it has been precipitating for the last several decades. And so This is not new, but it's definitely gotten worse. The popularity of choosing not to marry and seeing marriage as something that is simply archaic, that is an inconvenience, that is an impediment to happiness and satisfaction. That is certainly, I think, a more widespread feeling and belief than it was even 10 years ago. Marriage is facing increasing competition from other types of social arrangements, such as cohabitation. The number of Americans cohabitating with their romantic partner has more than doubled over the past three decades. It has become a widely acceptable practice particularly among younger Americans, nearly six in 10 younger Americans report having cohabitated with a romantic partner. Statistically, you are much more likely to get a divorce if you cohabitate before you get married. That's just true. You're more likely to have all kinds of relationship problems if you cohabitate before you get married. Not saying that's everyone. I didn't say it's 100%. I didn't say that uh, no one who doesn't live together and then gets married gets divorced. That's not what I said, but statistically, it is simply true that you are more likely to get a divorce. You are more likely to simply fall out of love, not end up together, even with the person that you thought were was your soulmate if you decide to live together before getting married. Again, it's almost like God knew what he was talking about when he instructed us in how to order our lives, that it wasn't just for rules, it wasn't just for restrictions, but that he actually cares about our well-being and us having an abundant life. He actually cares about our joy and about our protection. So the regulations that he puts in place, the parameters that we see him put in place throughout scripture, especially when it comes to sexuality and our relationships are actually for our physical and emotional, mental, spiritual good, not for our harm. And it seems like science and surveys are always trying to catch up to what God has been saying since the beginning of time. The survey says nowhere in the dec- is nowhere is the decline of marriage more evident than in the l- lives of young adults. Overall, more than one in three Americans have never been married. Only 25% of younger adults age 18 to 34 are currently married. A dramatic decline over the past few decades. In 1978, younger adults were almost twice as likely to be married. Society is worse off for it. We're worse off for it, I promise. And I I know a lot of young people, um, they want to be married, okay? So there's a lot of girls, women who are listening to this podcast, you're in that age bracket and you're not the kind of person who's like, yeah, I just don't want commitment. I don't, I don't, you know, want to be tied down to a husband. I just want to travel and work and have fun. So I don't want it to sound like I'm talking to you when I say this, but there are a lot of young people, probably a lot of young men, in that demographic who just don't want to commit yet. They don't just don't want to settle down. They think that they need to pursue their career. They need to make a certain amount of money. They need to check all of these boxes before they look for someone to share their life with. That has long-term consequences, not just on an individual's life, but also on society as a whole. The later you get married, the later you have kids, the more difficult it is to then replace the older generations, the less influence parents and grandparents have on those kids because you simply have less time with them the later that you have those kids. Again, I'm not talking to the people who are involuntarily Um, not married yet. I am talking to the people who are personally putting that off for the sake of convenience and for the sake of just irresponsibility and and selfish gain. Um, If you are able to find a husband or wife, a man or woman to spend the rest of your life with and commit to and have children with, I absolutely like I'll just say that's the better option. That's the better option than just doing what you want to do, feeling, doing what feels good at any given moment, um, 
chasing your own temporary definition of happiness, all of the things that you think that you can't do in a married relationship, you absolutely can. And hey, I will also just say, I know this is controversial, but if you are married, if you are a a Christian, and I'm just kind of implying that I'm talking to Christians here, but if you are in a marriage, um, I think that you should have children. I think that the Bible is very clear on that. The children are a blessing, that they're not an impediment to our happiness. They're not an impediment to our satisfaction. They're not a burden. Um, I think if you can have children, not everyone can have children. That's not God's plan for everyone. I think if you can have children, unless God is calling you to um, a very intense and very specific form of ministry that is that precludes having children. I do think every married couple who can have children should have children. I don't think you have to have 25 children. I think that there is, you know, wisdom and discernment and counsel and seeking and all of that. But like, you know, my husband and I even made the mistake of thinking there has to be a perfect time to have kids before we even try having kids. So I can empathize with with that feeling, but really there is no biblical support for that idea. There's no biblical support for putting off kids until you, you know, have traveled the world or until you've checked off, you know, boxes on your checklist. And the same is true. Um, the, the same is true in a sense for marriage. Obviously there are some like more stipulations there. You want to make sure that you're finding a solid person. Um, and you don't want to add, you know, instability to your life by wedding yourself to an already unstable person. So of course there's wisdom there, but in general, um, commitment, responsibility, the exclusivity, the fidelity, the support that comes from marriage and children is not just good for the individual. It is good for society as a whole. This hyper individualism that comes from the fragmentation of the family And basically all of us just living in our own little personalized worlds. It's not good. It's not good for the, it's not good for the individual. And again, it's not good for society as a whole. Now, maybe some of the reason why so many people are single today is because they have so many peculiarities and liabilities when it comes to dating. And I'm not saying you shouldn't have standards. I think that you should have high standards when it comes to dating. Um, But I think sometimes, especially social media, I just wonder if it's added to this, we have too many, like too many qualifications that someone has has to reach before we consider giving them the time of day. I mean, I know people like I know people like that, that their uh, qualifications for their future husband are not about their godliness or not about their character, but they're about like random attributes that have nothing to do with how good of a husband that or wife that person will be. And I think that could possibly be a problem here. I am sure the like rise of Tinder and dating apps has exacerbated that. So I'll get into that in just a second. Let me tell you about our second sponsor for the day. That is my Patriot Supply. So we're going to talk about in a second what's happening in Ohio, what's happening in Ukraine, a lot of instability. Like I just sometimes I just feel like I there's nothing I can do. And I just throw my hands up and I'm like, I just got to focus on making sure that the people around me are taken care of. And one way to do that is to ensure that you've got an emergency food supply. We don't know when things are really going to hit the fan. And you want to make sure if you lose access um, to your food supply that you and your family are taken care of. So get an emergency food supply kit from, from my Patriot Supply. Get one kit for every member of your family. So that's three months. It's a three-month emergency food kit for every member of your family. We're talking nutritious meals here. You're going to be so glad that you did this. And look, these boxes last for 30 years. And so you might not need it. Hopefully you'll never need it, but they last for 30 years. Um, It's an investment that you are making for your family that you can feel really good about. Just stow it away in your laundry room, and your pantry, wherever, and you know that you have it and you're good for three months, you can get multiple and then be good for six months, however much you think that you need. And if you go to mypatriotsupply.com right now, um, you will save... Uh, you or you will get in addition uh, to your purchase, you will get $200 worth of survival gear, $200 worth of survival gear with your purchase of emergency food kits. It's mypatriotsupply.com. You'll get free shipping to mypatriotsupply.com. OK, 
Okay, so here are a few things that I thought was interesting. Just uh, a few things that I that I wanted to point out to you that they kind of put in graph form. So college-educated Americans report more dating liability. So basically more reasons why they wouldn't date someone than non-college-educated Americans. So interesting. So smoke cigarettes, 90% of college graduates say, nope, I, I wouldn't date you because of that. Honestly, I understand. Like that would be would have been a dating liability for me if my husband would have smoked cigarettes. You know, as much, I look back though, I was so, you know, was, am, but I'm just thinking back to seven, eight years. Like I, I loved him so much and I enjoyed him so much and I was so attracted to him that I, I honestly, I don't know if he had smoked cigarettes, if that would have been I don't know that that would have been a deal breaker. I would have really not liked it. And I would have really, 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 really wanted him to stop. And I think he would have because he's a very disciplined person. But as much as I loved him and wanted to marry him, I don't know that cigarettes would have been like, no, I absolutely cannot marry you. It would have had to stop. But you know what I'm saying? So I don't even know if I could 100% say that as much as I hate cigarettes but that's something that you kind of know in hindsight once you realize like how much you just love 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 the person that you end up marrying um 77 percent of college graduates say being unemployed that's a deal breaker 62 percent of high school or less say that's a deal breaker that's interesting again what do you mean by unemployed are you in between jobs are you like an entrepreneur are you chronically unemployed that would be a deal breaker for me lives in another state. 74% of college grads, 64% of high school grads or less say that that is a liability. Again, I don't know if that would have been a liability for me. That would have made it a lot more difficult. But if you meet the right person, the long distance thing is doable. It's workable. Oh, this is funny. Um, College graduates, 67% said that they would not date someone who does not trust vaccines. 67% of college grads said that they would not date someone who does not trust vaccines. Okay, so they just want the people who nod along to everything the big pharma says that don't question the COVID vaccine at all. That's pretty incredible, especially considering yesterday's episode. So these are people who just want someone who regurgitates mainstream talking points. Interesting. That is true. Okay, so 67% of college grads say that only 33% of high school or less says that. Like I see all of these polls all the time, like the difference in the politics and the cultural views of PhDs, college grads, high school or less. Like it seems like you have lot like your common sense wanes the more degrees you have. And I say that as someone who has a college degree. And I hope that's not true. Like I hope I've retained my common sense to the point to where I'm still conservative and I wouldn't say stupid stuff like this but man you just get so brainwashed it seems like at so many of these institutions you start just saying and believing really stupid stuff 65 percent of college grads say that being a Trump supporter is a liability they wouldn't date someone who is a Trump supporter only 41 percent of high school or less say that really 65 percent the large I mean a pretty large majority of college grads are saying that Wow, that's pretty incredible. 60% of college grads say that um, they would not date someone who lives with their parents. 54 say that they would not date someone who has children. 52% of college grads say that they would not date someone who is very religious. 52%. Um, 49% say that they wouldn't date someone who did not go to college half of college grads wouldn't date someone who didn't go to college at least like half would but that's crazy um this is interesting um 49 okay so 45 percent of college grads say that not believing in god would be a liability uh, 49% of high school or less say that it would be a liability so basically the majority of college grads think it's fine for their person, the person that they want to date, to be an atheist. A slight majority of high school or last people think that. Also very troubling. Very troubling. Like, do people not understand where morality comes from? Do people not understand where right and wrong comes from? You just think that you're going to marry some moral relativist and that things are going to turn out fine? It might. It might. 
but only because that person probably has a very strong moral compass who doesn't they don't even realize that they are actually getting their morality from the creator of the universe but like marrying a moral relativist i promise you will always end in heartbreak wow people are so silly um uh let's see 43 percent 43 percent of college grads say mm, wouldn't date a republican uh 38 percent this is interesting like 38 percent of college grads say that um dating someone who is much shorter than you is a liability so most college grads would say that's not a liability um 30 <laughs> so the majority the majority of college grads would say that being a feminist is not a liability. Only 34% of college grads say that being a feminist is a reason not to date someone. Again, huge mistake. Huge mistake. Only 23% say that being a Democrat is a liability. Wow. Again, mistake. Mistake. Um, so that's interesting. Roughly two thirds of Democrats who were polled in this say that they would be less likely to date a Republican. More than six in 10 self identified Republicans report that they would be less likely to date a Democrat. And so that's pretty, that's pretty even there. 84% of Democrats say that they would be less likely to date a Trump supporter, including nearly three quarters who say they, they would make them, this would make them a lot less likely to consider dating someone. 39% of women compared to 55% of men would be less likely to date a feminist, while 21% say that they'd be more likely to date someone who identifies this way. So 55% of men say that they would be less likely to date a feminist. Honestly, I don't, I, I don't blame them. Um, so I thought that that was so interesting that we're seeing the decline of marriage. And we're seeing a lot of, I would say, dissatisfaction with being single at the same time. And a, a lot of loneliness, a lot of feelings of purposelessness. We talked about a couple of weeks ago that uh, that new CDC study that shows the precipitous rise of depression and thoughts of suicide among teenage girls. And so like, I think that among women, like there's a lot of loneliness. There's a lot of discontentment. There's a lot of insecurity, even as they are constantly telling themselves and each other how awesome and enough and beautiful and perfect they are. And I think that that combination is manifesting itself in some of these ridiculous standards that apparently people have for their potential dating partner. Not all of them are bad standards, but some of them are very arbitrary and some of them are just bad. Like, you don't care if the person that you're going to date doesn't believe in God. The majority of college grads don't believe that. Like, some of it is just a total lack of wisdom, is total foolishness. And we wonder why so many young people aren't getting married, aren't committed, and just don't really understand how the world works. And it's also, like, I think marriage and having kids, it's not absolutely necessary to caring for future generations. It's not necessary to having an investment in your community and what happens to your country. I know that there are plenty of single people and plenty of people without kids who really care about the future and what's going to happen to the country. They really care about freedom and our rights and all of that, but it absolutely helps. It absolutely helps for you to be able to see in the faces of the people that you love more than life itself, that you love more than anything in the world, the future of the country, and to consider how your policy decisions today, how your politics, the things that you choose to stand up for today, how they will affect your children and grandchildren. Yeah, that gives you a bigger and better perspective of what really matters and why. Again, not everyone has to have that in order to be able to really care about the future, but it really helps. Most people can't. Like, I mean, I think about when I was single and when I didn't have kids, the things that I thought that I understood about children, about marriage, about the world, how things work, the things that I thought that I cared about, the things that I straight up didn't care about because they simply did not affect me. And they didn't really puncture my bubble that I had been able to create for myself as just like a single working woman. 
And now that bubble is so punctured by marriage and by family and just community and all of the commitments that are going by the wayside today that I care a lot more. Like I have a lot more compassion. I have a lot more understanding. I have a much bigger investment, a much bigger stake in the future than I would have as a, just a single person. That's just a fact. Okay. That's just a fact because now I am looking at people who represent that future. And so I say that to say like, what is the future of the country when you have a lot of people not all single people, but when you have a lot of people who seem to be, as represented in this survey, chiefly concerned with themselves and their happiness and how they feel and having their needs being met and believing that the most important thing in life is to simply love themselves and to pursue their own happiness. Like, what do you think that kind of country will look like? It's very different than the country that we've had in years past that has been, um, marked by generosity and sacrifice and commitment, even when it's hard. I mean, I don't think you really have a country after that. I mean, you have no will probably to survive or to even preserve what your country was founded upon and pair that with the propaganda that people have been getting in schools and certainly in universities for so long to say that the founding of America America is evil and not worth preserving. I do worry. I worry about the future of the country. I worry about the future of the country policy-wise when it's run by people who don't have kids putting policies in place that greatly affect kids, telling us that they know better. I mean, I think about some people right now, like AOC, people who think that they can make policy when it comes to education, when it comes to poverty, when it comes to the genital mutilation of children in the name of gender affirmation. And I'm like, you don't even know what it's like to love a child more than you love yourself like you you have you have no investment you have no stake you don't know and so like the country run by all kinds of people like that puts us in a bad place that's what i think and not to mention these people who have these arbitrary standards like you will end up unhappy I think you can be single and happy for your whole life. I think that singleness can be an absolute gift. I think that's biblical. Um, but it depends on what the motivation is, right? Single for the sake of the Lord, single for the sake of obedience, single for the sake of purity, single for the sake of mission, single for the sake of just simply being in the place where God has you. Yeah, that's all one thing. Single for the sake of narcissism, single for the sake of just doing you. Yeah, that's going to lead you into a sad place, no matter what Chelsea Handler says. All right, uh, let's get into the more serious stuff. We'll spend a little bit on that, and we will talk about what's happening in Ohio and what is happening in Ukraine. And I'll go ahead and just tell you about our last sponsor of the day. We'll get that out of the way, and then we'll talk about everything that's going on there. So let me tell you about Eden Pure. It's an air purifier. We've used it in our home. I even like to travel with it because it's a kind of air purifier that you just plug right into the wall. And it's the Thunderstorm Eden Pure air purifier that uses Oxy technology that naturally sends out O3 molecules into the air, which seek out odors and air pollutants in your home and destroys them. And so your home smells bad from dirty diapers, cigarette smoke, something like that, or your hotel room is musty, just plug this in and this can really help. Right now, you can save $200 on an Eden Pure Thunderstorm 3-pack for whole home protection. You'll get three units for under $200. It's a fraction of the cost compared to other air purifiers that can go for over $600. You can put one in every room of your house. With this special offer, you're getting three units for under $200. Go to EdenPureDeals.com. Put in discount code Allie to save $200. This is EdenPureDeals.com. Code Allie. Shipping is is free. Okay, so let's get an update on Ohio. We talked about this last week in the same episode that we talked about the craziness that's happening in our skies with the Biden administration shooting down Chinese spy balloons and what that actually means. We also talked about nuclear war in that episode, which we will get to in a second. But first, let's talk about what's going on on our own soil within our own shores. Let's talk about what's going on in Ohio because this is still a disaster area. You'll remember from last week's episode that on February 3rd in East Palestine, we didn't hear about the story until several days later, but there was a catastrophic train derailment in East Palestine, Ohio that caused um, 
a, a very dangerous explosion. And then there was actually a controlled explosion to release some of these dangerous gases and chemicals that were in some of these railway cars to try to prevent some kind of crazy spontaneous combustion that would have um, caused even more havoc in the area. We talked about that there are residents there that have said that their animals are dying or sick. A woman um, reported that all of her chickens had died. Foxes are dying. Dogs are sick. Some people are reporting different kinds of skin conditions that um, they're having a hard time catching their breath, that they're having a hard time even getting health care because the doctors don't know what to test for. Governor DeWine is saying that, you know, the municipal water, the water that you're getting should be fine. And the EPA there is saying that the air is fine, that they're testing it that it's okay. And yet the residents there are saying, well, I am still dealing with the side effects of this. And it doesn't seem like the people who were supposed to be doing their job, who were supposed to clean up this mess, who were supposed to make sure that a catastrophe like this does not happen. It doesn't seem like they actually care. I've gotten several messages from you guys who live in Ohio saying that your local governments and you feel even your state governments are actually very corrupt. Now, I don't live in Ohio. I've never lived in Ohio. I can't give a firsthand uh, account uh, to say that that is true, but a lot of you are really disappointed in how your local and state governments are handling this and have handled several things in the past, including things like um, COVID and um, and all of that. So Governor DeWine, Republican governor of Ohio, he has asked for help from FEMA. Now, FEMA government agency that typically helps with natural disasters like hurricanes or like earthquakes. Um, President Biden apparently said, no, we are not going to send FEMA to help you. This is just not something that they're equipped to help with. Some people are criticizing Biden for that, basically saying, you know, that shows he doesn't care. We're giving all this money to all these different causes around the world, and we're not even going to send FEMA to help people in Ohio. Um, I think that there's plenty of criticism to be had of President Biden, especially that he has not been there. He hasn't even visited the area of disaster, but not sending FEMA there, I'm not totally sure is a legitimate thing to criticize because apparently FEMA is working with the EPA, is even working with the CDC. Not, nece- not that we necessarily trust those entities, but according to a White House spokesperson, if you want to trust the spokespeople for the White House, they say that FEMA is coordinating with these agencies that are apparently better equipped to deal with the disaster and to deal with the health consequences of um, of the disaster. Uh, nevertheless, people are criticizing President Biden because he is not, not only is he not sending FEMA there, okay, we can debate about whether or not that is the correct move or a move that shows a lack of compassion, but that he hasn't been present, that he's barely talked about it. And where is he instead? He is visiting Ukraine. So that's really kind of the big gripe. It always has been the big gripe, by the way, about President Biden and his administration, not just when it comes to Ohio, but when it comes to the interests of the American people in general. He can talk a big talk when it comes to the State of the Union address, saying that he understands that fentanyl overdoses are a really big deal, that it's killing hundreds of thousands of Americans every year. He can talk about the fact that we have an immigration crisis or that we need a better economy and all of these things. And he can say that he is putting America first and that he cares about the well-being of Americans, but it's not seen in his actions. What's seen in his actions, what has been seen in his actions since the very beginning is that he actually prioritizes the needs and the well-being of other countries before he prioritizes the needs and the security of his own constituents, even the people who voted for him. And as I've said many times, that may makes a wicked leader. You can call me a nationalist. You can say that I'm bigoted for caring about America first, or that's MAGA or whatever. I really don't care. You're wrong. If you believe that a country's leader should care more about the people in another country, or even equally that they should care about the people of another country as they care about the people in this country. That is immoral. That is wicked. That is wrong. Countries are like families. You care about your family the most. That doesn't mean you hate your neighbors. That doesn't mean that you don't want them to do well. That doesn't mean that you don't help them when you can help them, but you don't do so at the expense of your own children. 
You don't allow your children to starve and your children to suffer and your children to be vulnerable in order to supply the needs of people whose own parents should be taking care of them. If you can do both, great. The point is, is that President Biden is not doing both. So he decided that he was going to um, go to Ukraine during the surprise visit. This was reported by The Hill yesterday. And he announces $500 million in new military aid to Ukraine. President Biden on Monday announced the U.S. would be providing $500 million in additional military aid to Ukraine during a surprise visit to Kiev, and he teased new sanctions to crack down on entities aiding Russia's war efforts in the country. Together, we've committed nearly 700 tanks and thousands of armored vehicles, 1,000 artillery systems, more than 2 million rounds of artillery ammunition, more than 50 advanced launch rocket systems, uh, anti-ship and air defense systems, all to defend Ukraine. The forthcoming announcement, Biden said, includes artillery ammunition for long-range weapons, and all kinds of different weaponry. And he just wanted to make sure he tweeted that America is behind Ukraine 100%. Mitch McConnell recently said something that he has said several times that the most important thing going on in the world right now is the battle between Russia and Ukraine, which is quickly growing into a battle between Ukraine, the United and the United States and Russia and China. Now, tell me why a country that most people, including most politicians, could not point to on a map a little over a year ago is worth us possibly being wiped off off the face of the earth through nuclear war against China and Russia. It's not. It's not. That's not to say those people aren't made in the image of God. That's not to say that they don't have the same innate worth and value that we do. That's not to say that we shouldn't hope you know, them success in Ukraine, whatever. But the way that we have lionized Zelensky and the way that we have upheld Ukraine as some beacon of democracy when it is not that, the way that we have said we will stop at nothing to defend this country, when you're making calculations, as you have to do as a politician, by the way, as you have to do as the leader of a country, that calculation does not make sense unless there is something going on here that personally benefits Biden and those who are making these decisions to send all of this money to Ukraine. It just doesn't make any logical or moral sense. And people who are saying, oh, that lacks compassion. You don't care about what happens to Ukraine. Okay, Show me how much you care. List every world conflict going on right now. List every need that every single person in Africa has, that every single person in Asia has, and tell me why you aren't doing more to take care of them. Tell me why you are choosing not to send all of your money to the poor people in Zimbabwe, and instead you're choosing to feed yourself and your family. Wow, what a selfish bigot you are. You see how that logic works? We got our problems here in the United States. We got our problems here, all right? We have people who really need help. We have students that cannot read because our education system in general is so poor. We've got really big problems with employment, with people not being able to put food on the table because of the policy decisions that the people in charge have made. We've got people in Ohio that don't even know if they can drink their water right now. And by the way, that's a problem in several cities across the country, not just because of the many plane de- or, uh, train derailments that have happened, but just because our local governments are so incompetent. And this is basically a cakeistocracy, which means that we are run by idiots wedded with a kleptocracy where they're basically stealing from the rest of us to line their own pockets. And they're using war as a vessel to do that, in my opinion. And we might all die because of it. Like, that's that's the deal. That's what's I mean, that's what's on the table. That's my amateur assessment of what is really going on here. No, I do not think what's going on between Russia and Ukraine is the most important priority for Americans. Maybe it is something to care about. Like, maybe you should pay attention. Maybe we should pray for the innocent people who are involved in all of this, who did not ask for war who have been forced to be refugees in a million different ways and have had to run in the face of danger. I mean, yes, we should pray for them. We should care about them. You can send your own aid, but the people that we elected to care about our security and our well-being and our stability should be focusing on that, like clean up our water. 
Stop allowing career criminals to kill people because in the name of criminal and social justice, they're let out of jail. Like, have we considered focusing on those kinds of things? The kinds of things that are facing Americans on a daily basis? Like, have we considered just trying to make America a better place? I don't know. I know that's some crazy idea. That's some crazy nationalistic Nazi idea that the people that we elected should actually put their people first. But there it is. It's radical. I know. Uh, By the way, I believe that every leader of every country should put their people first. Every leader of every country should put their people first because country is like family. I believe that Zambia should put their people first. I think that they should care more about Zambians than they do about Americans or about Spaniards. I believe that Germans should care more about Germany and Germans than they do about the French. I believe that the French should care more about the interest of the French than they should the interests of people from Albania. Canadians should care more about their interests, their well-being, their security than they do about Americans. That should be how it goes. That doesn't mean we're hostile to each other. That doesn't mean we don't help each other. I'm not saying that I'm an isolationist, but I do believe in putting the interests of your country first and stop ignoring the dire needs that your people have in favor of freaking Ukraine. Come on. But I didn't give a speech today. I like I don't even want to get to it. I didn't give a speech today in Poland saying, you know, we are with Ukraine until the end. And we're just going to keep on hemorrhaging money that we don't have to support this effort. And he says, he says, he says this to defend his decisions. One year ago, the world was bracing for the fall of Kyiv. Well, I just come from a visit to Kyiv, and I can report Kyiv stands strong. (laughs) Kyiv stands proud. It stands tall. And most important, it stands free. When Russia invaded, it wasn't just Ukraine being tested. The whole world faced a test for the ages. Okay, the whole world um, faced a test for... The ages. I mean, they really do see this as their like Berlin Wall moment. And I just don't see it that way. And I don't think most Americans do. You know, I saw this Pew Research poll that showed what Americans feel about support of Ukraine and how it has declined. This came out on January 31st, Pew Research. And so um, in March of 22, when this started happening, when Russia invaded Ukraine, most people, let's see, 74% of Americans said, we're sending not enough aid to Ukraine, or it's just about right. 74% of Americans, so they were very for it. That has gone down. Pretty significantly by January uh, 23, um, only 51% believe that we're sending not enough or about right. And the amount of aid, 26% actually believe that we are sending too much versus only 7% in March of 22. This is very divided among Republicans and Democrats. Isn't that so interesting? I mean, it's actually interesting. In March of 22, it was Republicans who were more likely to say that we're not sending enough. Um, Democrats believed that it was about right for the most part. That's probably some like pro-Biden, anti-Biden thing going on there. But by January of 23, 40 percent of Republicans think it's too much versus only 15 percent of Democrats. 23 percent of Democrats think that we need to do more to help Ukraine. It's wild just how divided we are on that. But I mean, it is changing. People are realizing, wow, we got our own problems that we need to fix. We got our own problems that we need to fix here. And it would be just amazing. It'd be amazing to have an administration who really cared about that and prioritized that. Again, doesn't mean isolationist. It means priorities, right? Like he'd be in Ohio right now, maybe, and not Ukraine, if he really cared about his constituents more, don't you think? But like to them, big picture, 
excludes the well-being of America. Isn't that crazy? Go back and listen to some of my Great Reset episodes uh, with Justin Haskins if you want to learn more about that. Um, So... Putin decided, according to um, USA Today, that he will suspend the nuclear arms treaty as U.S.-Russia tensions build amid Ukraine war anniversary. Russian President Vladimir Putin announced Tuesday that Russia will pull back from a key nuclear treaty, ratcheting up tensions with the United States as President Joe Biden visited the region with a fresh pledge of support for Ukraine. He said that he was suspending Moscow's participation in New START, a strategic nuclear arms reduction treaty between the U.S. and Russia. He said that this action was being taken because of the U.S. and NATO without specifying more. New START is the last remaining nuclear arms reduction deal between the U.S. and Russia. It was signed in 2010 and extended for five years in 2021. It limits each side to 1,500 long-range nuclear warheads. I mean, I don't really know what that was doing, but this is definitely Putin's way of saying, yeah, it's on. It's on. And China apparently is deciding whether or not they are going to send military aid to Russia. This is not looking good. Not looking good. And look, I'm not saying that we should just be kowtowing to people like Putin. I don't think America should be kowtowing to dictators. And also, again, not saying that we shouldn't care about what happens in Ukraine, but this is disproportionate. What uh, what America what America has committed to. Um, instead of instead of focusing on the well-being and the security and the safety of its own people. Now, I'm just going to end with this. I'm going to end with a bit of encouragement because my husband and I were talking about this this morning. We saw reported in the Wall Street Journal that Putin decided that he was going to pull out of this agreement, um, this, you know, reduction in nuclear weapons. And, you know, people are talking more and more of nuclear war. Again, go back and listen to the episode that we did last week on this. It, it was like oddly comforting, actually, what my guest had to say, um, but also very informative and shows us what the risk is. But let me read you this quote that I've read time to time over the past few years from C.S. Lewis as he was living in an atomic age when people were talking about the threat of an atomic bomb. And he gave this encouragement, which I am just... I I always read, I sent it to my husband this morning. I was like, read this, remember this. It's so profound and so simple and so brutally honest and true that whenever we face yet another existential crisis, which seems to be, I don't know, we're on the clock for about every year, every two years at this point. Let us remember what C.S. Lewis said. It's a long quote. Bear with me. Maybe I'll bounce around a little bit and not read the whole thing, but I think it's really important and it will comfort you. So he says this, in one way, we think a great deal too much of the atomic bomb. How are we to live in an atomic age? I'm tempted to reply, why, as you would have lived in the 16th century when the plague visited London almost every year, or as you would have lived in a Viking age when raiders from Scandinavia might land and cut your throat any night, or indeed, as you are already living in an age of cancer, an age of syphilis, an age of paralysis, an age of air raids, an age of railway accidents, an age of motor accidents. In other words, do not let us begin by exaggerating the novelty of our situation. Believe me, you and all whom you love were already sentenced to death before the atomic bomb was invented, and quite a high percentage of us were going to die in unpleasant ways. We had indeed one very great advantage over our ancestors, uh, anesthetics, but we have that still. It is perfectly ridiculous to go about whimpering and drawing long faces because the scientists have added one more chance of painful and premature death to a world which already bristled with such chances and in which death itself was not a chance at all, but a certainty. This is the first point to be made and the first action to be taken is to pull ourselves together. If we are all going to be destroyed by an atomic bomb, let that bomb, when it comes, find us doing sensible and human things. Praying, working, teaching, reading, listening to music, bathing the children, playing tennis, chatting to our friends over a pint and a game of darts, not huddled together like frightened sheep and thinking about bombs. They may break our bodies. A microbe can do that. But they need not dominate our minds. Man, I love C.S. Lewis. I've loved C.S. Lewis since first reading him and gosh, I don't know middle school, Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, and then a renewed love in high school, junior and senior year, reading Mere Christianity and Screwtape Letters. And gosh, I never tire of reading his words. How simple and how true is that? The best writers, I think, the best teachers tell you things that you already know, but didn't realize that you knew. And I think C.S. Lewis does that so well. Whenever death comes, whether it be by nuclear war, whether it be by another pandemic, whether it be by the cakeistocracy, 
and the incompetence therein that runs this place, whether it's contamination of our food and water supplies is happening in some places or whatever it may be, let that death, let that catastrophe find us doing the next right thing in faith, with joy and excellence and for the glory of God. Because guess what? Psalm 139 says that all of our days were already written for us before any of them came to be, any and all of us. So whether we are looking at the threat of nuclear war or whether you were just looking at uh, maybe a, a really bad date, the point is that God is sovereign, that your life has been planned and that worrying, as Jesus said, so poignantly worrying adds not a single hour, not a single second to your life. And so it's important for us to be informed about all of these things. It's important for us to look at the bad news, the worrying news, but it's even more important than that for us to be informed and equipped and empowered. Yes, but move forward um, in hope and in strength, knowing that God is totally in control, that he who sits in the heavens laughs, he holds them in derision who would mock him and mock his power and mock his people. That we can trust. We know who wins in the end. All right. That's all we've got time for today. We'll see you back here tomorrow. 